And welcome to Football Game Plan Starting Lineup. I'm Emery Hunt, the czar of the playbook, joined by Chris James. We're joined with Chris James, who is our football game plan analyst. We'll be taking you through all the ins and outs of fantasy football, getting you ready for the 2020 season. Chris, before people get into what they have to do for the draft and, and what they should do, who, what they shouldn't do, let's take a look at, at your draft philosophy. What would you say is your draft philosophy and how you go about attacking a fantasy draft? So fantasy is about volume. Volume is king and opportunity. So I try to get players that are going to be in a position to put up points, whether it's because their defense isn't the best, so they have to throw the ball all around the yard or run the ball a lot or do whatever it is. Whatever player is available that has volume that can be given to them, that's king. So that's what I look for. And when you look at the draft, there's obviously some do's and some don'ts. Like you don't take a kicker number one overall. But <laughs> what would you say is the do's and don'ts of fantasy football drafting? Understand, <clears throat> excuse me, understand that each position has its own value. So as an example, quarterback, there's such depth there where you don't want to go too early, even if a guy's talented. Uh, so you want to grab, let's say, a position that doesn't have a lot of depth running back being that one that usually people covet really early in drafts. So understand where you're drafting, understand the people that you're drafting with, and then understand that each position has its own, you know, bandwidth of how many good players you can get in it. Yeah, and a lot of times people look at, man, okay, there's some running backs here, there's some wide receivers there, but there's a lot of rookies too that are talented. Do you trust rookies enough to draft these guys early? What would you say is your thoughts on, on drafting rookies? Someone said something once, and I'm going to quote it, but not quote it, something about sponsorship. So basically, if a team invests in you high in the draft, especially if you play certain positions, running back high in the draft, uh, wide receiver high in the draft, they're going to give you every opportunity to make them look as good as possible. So from a fantasy football perspective, if I have a running back that goes in the top 10, that guy's going to get all the carries that year. So that's what I look for from a rookie. I don't want a guy who's more fringy or taken late. I want a guy that's going to get all the opportunities. Yeah, because if you're like me, you, you like these undrafted guys, these practice squad guys, but you got to be real and honest with yourself when you're talking fantasy football. You got to get guys that's going to actually be out there on the field. So let's just roll right into your quarterback rankings. We're going to do quarterbacks, running backs, receivers, tight ends, and then your starting lineup uh, at the end of the show. So rolling right into your quarterbacks, your top 10, starting with number one, the reigning I was about to say the reigning Heisman Trophy winner, but he he does have a Heisman Trophy, but he's the reigning MVP, Lamar Jackson. Yeah, and you look at it like this. I mean, if Lamar Jackson were to lose, let's say, 25% of his value, he would still be a top three quarterback from what he did last year. Like, his, his season was so tremendous that he could come down from the more than 1,000 yards rushing to, let's say, 700, and it's still so impactful. He does so many things, and from a fantasy perspective, no matter what type of league you're playing in, a guy who can tote the rock like Lamar can and also throw the ball like he can is a guy that you can't miss at number one. Yeah, you look at the rest of your top 10, and it's a pretty impressive list, both in real life and in fantasy. Who out this top 10 do you see making the biggest jump in 2020? You know, I think a big jump is going to be made by Carson Wentz this year. Uh, they have a team that does not seem to want to, let's say, have a bell cow running back. They want a bell cow quarterback. And if Carson Wentz's body holds up, which it did a pretty good job last year, this guy's going to get all the opportunity. Doug Peterson's going to let him throw the ball a bunch. And he might have actually use his legs a little bit this year as well. You think about Carson Wentz, and I, I've said this before. To me, last year was his best season. Um, this was a guy that, that kind of reminded me of John Elway during the early 80s and late 80s when he was dragging those Denver Broncos. He not I, get, Don't get me wrong. I'm a big fan of Ricky Nattel and Mark Jackson, those guys like that. But he was dragging those Broncos teams to those Super Bowls. Uh, I thought Wentz did a great job last year doing the same with that Eagles offense. I see Tom Brady down there as well. You're down in the Tampa area. I would be remiss if I didn't ask you about Tom Brady and what you expect out of him this season with the Bucs. He's getting an upgrade at receiver with all due respect to Julian Edelman, who's a great player. He's not Mike Evans. So he gets Mike Evans. He gets Chris Godwin. He gets a vertical passing game. No matter how well he does this season, he's going to have, again, all the opportunity in the world to put up numbers, and that's why he's in my top 10. And rolling right along with quarterbacks 11 through 20, and at number 11 is the New York Giant, Daniel Jones. And Daniel Jones had an up-and-down season last year, started off really well, 
and had some moments where he kind of spun out of control. The Giants' defense got better, but it's not good enough yet to stop people from putting up points, so he's going to have to put up points. I like what he's able to do this year. I see at number 16 you have Aaron Rodgers. Why is there's a lot of talk about Aaron Rodgers within the fantasy community? It seems like people are split down the middle. He's a bust, or you have to have him. Why is he such a tricky player in fantasy football? Opportunity. So Aaron Rodgers in the past, why he was such a fantasy bull player who just got you lots of points and winning championships is because he had the opportunity to throw the ball. They're doing a more run-centric offense now. He's not going to throw the ball a bunch. He's still an excellent quarterback. But again, if they're not going to throw the ball 30, 40 times a game, he's not going to have the chance to truly put up those numbers. Yeah, it's one of those situations where he may be a great reality football player, but fantasy, he could be an issue. But at number 20, you have the number one overall pick in Joe Burrow. What are you excited about Joe Burrow, Joe Burrow and what he brings to the table in 2020 with the Bengals? Joe Burrow reminds me a lot of, and I've said this, Russell Wilson. Has that confidence, the leadership qualities, and I think he's going to hit the ground running extraordinarily. Plus, that offensive line is going to be a lot better than it was last year, and the pieces around him should be good. They have some issues on defense, so he's going to have to put up big points. Yeah, he is walking into a, a tailor-made situation. Uh, you talk about T. Higgins, they drafted along with him. A.J. Green's healthy. Tyler Boyd. John Ross is out there healthy. That's a plus. Joe Mixon. So there's a lot of talent for him to hit the ground running. And since he almost sounds like your number 21 quarterback on your list as we move him right along with your rankings, Baker Mayfield. And, you know, I think Baker's going to be in a better offense for him. So they're going to do a lot of, you know, play action bootlegs, get him out on the edge and let him use that strong arm and get it to a guy who Odell Beckham could be the number one receiver in. And we'll talk about that later, but get it to those guys. Uh, they're going to function very similarly to how Thielen and Stefan Diggs did in this offense with Stefanski. So I think that he has an opportunity to put up some decent numbers, but not enough to be in that top 10 or that higher upper echelon of quarterbacks. Yeah, I think the play-action passing game will be his best friend this season under Kevin Stefanski. But I noticed something on your list. Uh, when you look down, you have Justin Herbert and also Nick Foles for Chargers and Bears, respectively. Not the two starters in Tyrod Taylor and Mitch Trubisky. What's up with that? So, I feel like even though Tyrod Taylor has earned the job, he's the starter, at some point this season they're going to give the reins to Justin Herbert. Uh, they picked him top in the top 10. This It's going to happen. It happens every year. There's not many. In fact, I can't think of any quarterback in the last 10 years that's been taken in the top 10 that hasn't started that year. So he's going to move in, and he's going to start some games. With Nick Foles, I know they're starting Trubisky, but they're going to go to Nick Foles at some point this year. That's just my gut feeling because I think he gives them a better chance to win games. Now you look at these quarterbacks that you have ranked you know, 1 through 32. Uh, who would you say is the biggest sleeper out of this group? I like this guy because I like the swagger he has. It's Gardner Minshew. So they just got rid of Leonard Fournette. This doesn't seem to be a team that's going to run the ball a lot this year. In fact, I think they're going to probably do a lot to Chris Thompson out of the backfield. So he's going to put up big numbers because he's going to have big opportunity. And the defense isn't what it was three years ago. So he's going to throw the ball all around the yard and, like I said, put up some pretty big numbers. You know, just to use this analogy, maybe you can relate, but I know many of our people that are listening or watching can't relate. We're going to talk about big 60 cookies, right? Who's the best value out the quarterback position? Someone that's not, you know, not Oreo, not Chips Ahoy, but big 60 cookies can can do the job just right. Yeah. So, and I would actually stick with that Cam Newton. He is Oreos, right? Okay. <laughs> Cam Newton's much better than Big 60. <laughs> okay. The opportunity that's offered because of his body, whether or not it's going to hold up, he's not being drafted as highly as he probably should be. I think that Cam Newton has a chance to put up some really big numbers this year. And he's going to be the guy that you can snake in the middle rounds of the draft and could be a top five quarterback this year. Shout out to Big 60 Cookies. Did some good jobs for me in the, in the early 90s. Uh, when you look at the biggest bust, which quarterback are you staying completely away from? So I'm going to stay away from Derek Carr. Uh, even though they've put a lot of pieces there, he just doesn't have an affinity for pushing the ball down the field. It's kind of detrimental considering that they've got all these speed guys that they brought in. But I'm going to stay away from Derek Carr. I just don't see him having the offered opportunity 
because John Gruden wants to run the ball, but also he's just not, he's a conservative quarterback and that doesn't win in fantasy. Be sure to order your copy of the Go-Go Offense by Coach Brennan Marion on footballgameplan.com slash go-go offense. Coach Marion goes through the ins and outs of his explosive offense, one that's tearing up the college football field and putting a lot of points on the scoreboard. Again, you can order your copy at footballgameplan.com slash go-go offense. And now we just transition over to my favorite position, the running back position, looking at the top 10, starting with number one, Mr. Christian McCaffrey. Absolutely. So, again, opportunity. But the other thing, availability. Christian McCaffrey seems to never be injured. And knock on wood that he won't be this year, but he just simply doesn't miss games. So even though there's other guys who are as talented, will have opportunity, he also has that thing where he literally does not miss games. And that's what you need, consistency. How much do you think he benefits from playing with a guy like Teddy Bridgewater? I think he's going to benefit immensely from being in a new offense where they're going to throw the ball around the yard. It's going to look a lot like LSU did in some respects, and we've discussed this. I think Teddy Bridgewater is underrated, and he has a lot of similarities to Joe Burrow. That offense is going to be really good this year. Yeah, speaking of LSU, looking at number nine, you have Clyde Edwards-Hilaire, uh, the talented running back out of LSU and going to a perfect situation at Kansas City. Absolutely, and the talent's there, the situation's there. One thing that I do expect, though, he's lower on my list than some others because I don't think he's going to be the true starter early in the season. With no preseason, and also they like Daryl Williams, he's probably going to start early, and they'll work Edwards and Lair in. So he's not going to get you the full complement of points, but once he does hit the field consistently, this guy's going to light it up. Yeah, he's going to be tremendous, man. You know one guy that was also tremendous – as a rookie, as we move on to running backs 11 through 20, it's Kareem Hunt, the Cleveland Browns. Absolutely. And so I'm doing this with PPR scoring. I think they're going to use him quite a bit. Nick Chubb isn't the best pass catcher, with all due respect to him. Heck of a running back, but that's not his strong suit. Kareem Hunt, that is a strong suit of his. Very well-rounded back, so he's going to get a lot of targets, a lot like an Alvin Kamara out of the backfield. It's going to be really useful, and I think he'll probably get about 30% of the carries. Yeah, he, I mean, that backfield is just tremendous. You, you talk about Bo Jackson, Marcus Allen. You're talking about, to use a Browns reference, Ernest Biner and Kevin Mack. I think it's going to be impressive what they're going to do out there this year. Speaking of dual backfields, it makes sense out of this Melvin Gordon, Phillip Lindsay situation. Because just when you thought Phillip Lindsay was a guy out there in Denver, they go out and sign Melvin Gordon. Now they have two talented tailbacks to get a ball to. And, you know, I don't think they're going to just completely – phase Philip Lindsay out. He's too talented to be completely phased out, but I will say this. They paid Melvin Gordon for a reason. I think Melvin Gordon's going to get the bulk of the carries, and Philip Lindsay will be a change of pace back. Uh, they're going to have one of the sneaky good offenses in the NFL this year out in Denver. Yeah, I, I love what Denver has put, ta- put on the table at running back receiver. I like Drew Locke as well. Tight end is, is real deep out there. If their offensive line uh, can get up to speed, they'll be really dangerous out there in the Mile High City. Uh, do you trust the Philadelphia Eagles head coach, Doug Peterson, to give the ball to Miles Sanders? You know, last year, it, it looked like, hey, man, Sanders is the one that's averaging four and a half, five yards to carry. Every time you give him the football, keep giving him the ball. Uh, do you trust their situation out there in Philly to feel comfortable taking Miles Sanders pretty high? I do not. And the major reason is because at no point in his coaching career has he ever had a true bell cow back. Uh, Like I said, the reason Carson Wentz is, on the quarterback side, a guy that I'm leaning on is I think he's going to get the opportunities. Miles Sanders will not. I think that Miles Sanders last year got that bump because everyone was injured. All the skilled players were injured, so he got a lot of carries. So did Boston Scott. So it was more due to the attrition at the skill positions than them actually wanting to feed one back. Yeah, let's just move right along to 21 through 32. And at number 24, you have Raheem Mostert, who started to get, catch fire later in the season. And I think he is still running against Green Bay in that playoff game. What do you think about him? So this is an interesting one for me. I think the talent's there, and he's so explosive with the ball. The problem is we don't know how this running back situation is going to shake out. He would be much higher because he's on one of the best schemed running back situations in the entire league on a great team with a great offensive line problem is you don't know how many opportunities are going to get to touch the ball so that's why i'm at 24 but he really if they give him the full compliment he'd be a top 10 running back 
And speaking of top 10 running backs, I'm a big fan of Jonathan Taylor in Indianapolis. And you have both of the Colt running backs on this list with Marlon Mack. Why double up on Colt backs? The reason is because that running back situation, the Colts running back itself, no matter who it is, will be an excellent one. That offensive line is great. They're not going to throw the ball all around the yard with Phillip. Uh, Oh my goodness, Rivers. Rivers. <laughs> forgot for a second. My apologies. He forgot the... too. He's like 40 years <laughs> old, so he forgot too. Don't, no worries. <laughs> and early in the season, they've already said this. Marlon Mack's going to have a role. He's probably going to be the early starter. He's not as talented as Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor will eventually take over that role, but it's just going to take some time. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of what they have uh, as a flex player too. You, you look at, you got Marlon Mack, you got Jonathan Taylor. Um, you have 20, number 21 out there. His name slips my mind, but he's a, you know, he's a, yeah, Naheem Hines. He's a flex guy, you know, so they got three dudes that can really tote the rock, man. Bingo. They do. And that running back, again, that running back core and that running back situation should be a great one because Frank Wright does want to run the ball more than his old counterpart, Doug Peterson in Philly. Yeah, we saw what happens when you ask Philip Rivers to win the game in the last two minutes. Hopefully that doesn't happen in Indianapolis this year. What about Fournette? You know, at, at the time, he was with Jacksonville, looked promising, coming off his best season. Now he's going to Tampa Bay. How does he fit with the Bucks? So here's one of the things that I don't think people pay attention to. Everyone's talking about, oh, he and Leonard Fournette's super talented. We all know that. But this offense isn't designed for a running back to be fantasy successful. And the reason it's not is because Bruce Arians wants to throw the ball down the field. He wants to push the pace. He wants to do that. Plus... People say, okay, David Johnson had a great season. With all due respect, Pete David Johnson was a lot better than virtually anyone else in the NFL over the last decade. So we can't just say that even though Fournette's good, he's not Pete David Johnson. I mean, Fournette to me is going to be one that's going to slowly take over that role. It's going to be the closer, kind of like what we saw LeGarrette Blunt do in, in uh, New England, like we saw Corey Dillon do uh, in New England. So we'll see a lot of Fournette, but I like how they are going to keep rolling with Ronald Jones and you know everyone else that they have in the back of LaShawn McCoy. So it should be fun to watch Tampa play offense. So with all of the running backs that we just listed, who's the best value running back that you would roll with? So I think the best value running back is, oddly enough, Jordan Howard. And the reason is that Miami Dolphins offense is going to be vastly improved this year. Howard, there are some guys that are more talented than Howard, but he's been a consistent running back wherever he's been. He's put up numbers in all the spots he's been in. And again, they're going to be better on the offensive line and be able to actually run the ball this year. So I think he's a good value in the mid rounds. Who's your biggest sleeper? So my biggest sleeper is actually going to be Daryl Henderson. And I know Cam Akers is the guy who's taking over that backfield, but you can't sleep on the amount of talent that Daryl Henderson has. I think that you can get him in a super late round, to be honest, probably that 12th, 13th round, and he can end up having tremendous value for you because at worst case, he's at least a third down back and does pretty much a Chris Thompson type role, which is valuable for a flex and fantasy football. Yeah, and, and when you look at bust. I'll toss mine out there right now. I would probably stay away from the one guy everybody's talking about and, you know, he's going to do this, this, and that. I probably would stay away from Josh Jacobs very early, like first round uh, because I just don't trust John Gruden. And he has proven time and time again he's going to find someone else to give that football to and rather than just give the ball to the starter that has proven himself. We saw this with Napoleon McCollum and um, I'm sorry, Napoleon Kaufman and Tyrone Wheatley. We saw it with Charlie Garner. We, we've seen it time and time again. Thomas Jones and and also uh, Michael Pittman. We've seen him do this all throughout his coaching tenure. So I can't trust him just yet. So I would probably pass on, on Josh Jacobs. But who's the biggest bust for you at the running back position? And this is not a slight to him because I think he's talented. I'm glad he finally got an opportunity. But I think they're going to throw the ball a lot out in Arizona. So I don't think King and Drake, and he's going, you know, the early second, sometimes late first to some people. I don't think he's going to have that value. And also, Chase Edmonds isn't going away. He's also talented. So you may start to see it roll more into not a full-on committee, but I just don't think they'll have as many opportunities for him to carry the ball because they're going to feed DeAndre Hopkins and the rest of those receivers. And Kyler Murray will also use his legs a little bit as well. Yeah, I'm a big Chase Edmonds fan. And I toss out another bus right quick. Uh, Austin Eckler, I think a lot of people in the fantasy community are expecting him to be Marshall Falk. 
I just don't see him being that guy. And plus, I just think that we'll see a committee approach out there as well. You talk about using multiple backs. I think Los Angeles will try to use Tyrod Taylor as an, a, you know, as a help piece to the run game. And also you have Justin Jackson, you have Austin Eckler. I think we'll see a lot of those guys maybe split. So that way uh, Eckler can go back to being a more functional role like we've seen him do early so far in his career. I don't think he can be that bell cow guy. I, if he proves me wrong, he proves me wrong. But I think he's better served as a complimentary back. What are your thoughts on Eckler? So Eckler put up amazing numbers last year, especially when Melvin Gordon wasn't there. And then he put up really good numbers even when Melvin Gordon came back. The difference is quarterback change. If Phillip Rivers was still there, he'd be super high on Philip Rivers checked down a lot or threw the ball in the double coverage. So it was one of those situations to Phillip Rivers. So that's why you saw so many targets with Austin Eckler. And this year, Tyrod Taylor is not going to utilize him in the same manner. And with him trying to get you know 20 carries in a game, I, t- I to some extent agree with you. I don't know if he's that guy, the 20 carries per game guy, but they'll be loading the box a little bit more. It'll be a little bit of a different feel, especially if they bring the rookie in later in the season. Uh, man, you know, it's, it's that old thing, you know, perseverance, consistency, hard work, you know what I mean? Uh, my goal is to put the same work into, you know, my businesses, my family that I put into football, you know, and, and I've been running with that mantra since, you know, since I got married back in 97, you know, that if I'm going to have a successful marriage, I got to, you know, the same hard work and same cons- consistency and discipline I had in the football field, I got to put it in my marriage and with my kids and with my, with my businesses and all that, so. Uh, it teaches you a lot, man. You know how to deal with your fellow man and not look at his, his color, but look at you know what he can do for the overall good of what you're trying to accomplish. You know, so uh, it, you know, sports to me in general is just an incredible deal. When you, when you talk about football specifically, because of the closeness of guys, I, I just believe it's an amazing sport. Let's move out wide. Your position, the wide receiver position, Chris. When you look at this position, there's so many receivers in the NFL. I think the NFL is like three fourths wide receiver, and everybody else kind of fills in what he can. But joking, that's not a real number. But it feels like there's nine thousand receivers. So you have to break these things down into tiers. Let's start with tier one. As we're looking at tier one, your your list here. Explain what tier one is. Sure. So whether you're playing a ten teamer or a twelve teamer, and a twelve teamer. Tier one receivers are guys who are acceptable to take late in the first round or in a 10-teamer early in the second round. Uh, These are guys who are going to get consistent targets, probably double-digit targets per game. And they also have a track record that's proven that they can dominate games and consistently put up numbers for you. And looking at your list here, tier one, there's only four guys on your list in this tier. So why Devontae Adams at number one? I think that's a little bit surprising. So it was kind of like last year where I thought Michael Thomas was going to lead the NFL in both targets and overall fantasy points because there was no competition. It was basically just him being forced fed the ball. Now there's Emmanuel Sanders, which will take away some targets from him. Devontae Adams doesn't have competition. And to be candid, except for the he missed a few games, but the games he played in, he always saw double digit targets and he put up doggone good fantasy numbers week in and week out. I think that's going to expand this year because there's no competition at receiver for him. All right, now we move on to Tier 2. Explain to us what is Tier 2. Sure. So these Tier 2 guys are guys that don't have the same proven track record. You'll probably end up taking them in the third or the fourth round. But at the end of the day, they can win you weeks and win you seasons. So these are going to be your guys that, you know, they have exceptional talent. They just might not get the 10 to 12 targets per game like the Tier 1 guys. And looking at this, you look at Tyreek Hill. He leads off your tier two at number five. So what is it about Tyreek Hill? I think he's very underrated as a receiver. People may think he's just a gadget guy, but Zoo has put up some serious numbers. Tyreek Hill is one of those guys that is frightening for every defense coordinator who ever faces him. And that's the whole thing is he was at one point a gadget guy. He is a legitimate, real deal, top tier receiver now. Will go up and get the ball. He's only getting better. And he just, all he needs is two touches. He can get you two touchdowns and a buck 40. Now, I see you have two bucks on this list, but you have it unique. You have Chris Godwin ahead of Mike Evans, who is number nine. Uh, Why do you have Evans below Godwin? 
Sure. So I feel like in this offense with Tom Brady as the quarterback, I think there'll be less jump balls thrown to the outside or more or less pressure to throw the ball to the outside. You're going to get a lot of targets inside to Chris Godwin and then PPR scoring. It's helpful to get a guy who will lead the team in targets and receptions. And that's what I think Godwin's going to do this year out of the slot. Shout out to Jameis Winston just putting the ball up top. Yeah, let's, you go, let's you go fight for it. <laughs> when, you, when you look at tier three, explain what tier three means. So these are the guys that are going to make your money. So these are the guys that are going to be fifth, sixth round in that range. And these are the guys who they are probably the number one target on their team, but the team might not throw the ball enough to justify them going there. They may not have that explosive talent like an Odell Beckham Jr. or Tyreek Hill, but they're still guys that can start every week and win you some weeks, especially because they're usually uber consistent. Yeah, I love your explanation right there because these are the guys that you can ride with each and every week, no matter who the matchup is. And I see you have a duo, one of my favorite duos in the league, in Cooper Cup and Robert Woods. Love both guys because both guys understand the nuances of the position and they're not just one trick ponies. They have the speed to be able to burn, but they run excellent routes, consistently catch the ball, and they always put up numbers. And I think people just forget about them, especially Robert Woods. He's a guy that honestly, could be a top seven receiver this year with Brandon Cooks going. You talk about Tyreek Hill being someone that defensive coordinators hate to face. If I was a defensive coordinator, Robert Woods would be the one that would frustrate me because he's so good, man. He's polished. Yes. He's effective at all three levels. He's a catch and run guy also. I'm a big fan of Robert Woods. Now we're moving on to tier four. Give us a scoop on what that means. So these tier four guys are generally guys that they may be the number one target on the team, but the consistency isn't there yet. So they may be up and down because they can win you a week by putting up 35 points, and then the next week they may have six or seven. So these are gonna be guys that check a little bit later, that seventh to ninth round range. Again, they fill out your roster. You probably can't depend on them every week, but when they're facing certain defenses, you definitely wanna have them in. We talked earlier about Big 60 Cam Newton. You say he's more Oreo than Big 60, but when you look at Julian Elliman, a guy that's gonna that's gonna be on the receiving end of a lot of his passes, what do you think about that relationship with him and Cam? I think it'll be a great one because Edelman, people want to call him some level of a one-trick pony. He's just a slot receiver. I think he's super underrated for the fact that he, he does win contested catches. He does a lot of things. And yes, he's not the bigger body receiver we're used to seeing with Cam, but I think he'll be super helpful, kind of like Jared Cotri was back in the day when they went to the Super Bowl. And I think people forgot they had a pretty good relationship and Julian Edelman's a better version of him. So that's they will work out very well. And shout out to Jericho Cotri, man. He got to the Super Bowl. Philly Brown, all those guys. Cam brought those guys to the Super Bowl for all those haters out there that think Cam Newton is some scrub. But speaking of what we both talked about earlier, we're excited about the Denver Broncos offense. But I found it interesting that Cortland Sutton is your first Bronco, and he's listed all the way down this way on your list in Tier 4. Yes. So one thing that does happen is, yes, Drew Locke came in, did well down the stretch, and Cortland Sutton put up quality numbers, but he had a huge target share. I think that's going to be reduced this year. They're going to run the ball more with Melvin Gordon now that they have more talent in the backfield. They went and got Jerry Judy, KJ Hamler. You know, Noah Fant's going to get more targets. So when the target share comes down, I have to also bring down your value. It has nothing to do with the talent of the player. It just has to do with opportunity. That's smart stuff right there. And, and another guy that I would hate to coach against, or one I would love to coach, is number 31, Kevin Lockett. Tyler Lockett. His dad is Kevin Lockett. Yes. Tyler Lockett is the receiver we're talking about. Tyler Lockett is probably the best, the most underappreciated receiver in the entire NFL because he doesn't look the part. You look at Tyler Lockett, you don't even think he plays in the NFL because he's a slight upframe guy, except when you go watch him play and he's just better than you all the time. So I, I loved him when he came out of K-State. I love what he's done in the NFL. And I think that he... He's going to move down to the number two guy now. They have DK Metcalf, but he'll still give you good value and he'll still show up in certain weeks and can help you win. The K-State Lockets, that's almost like the kicking cold quits. You know, you get confused out there. But as you wrap up your tier four rankings, you see Sterling Shepard out there at number 37. What is it about him that intrigues you about his opportunities this upcoming season with Daniel Jones? So Jones will have to throw the ball and put up numbers. The issue is with the new coaching staff, I don't know how they're going to approach using those receivers, having Golden Tate, you know, having Evan Ingram. But 
I know that Sterling Shepard, at least for me, is a guy who, when he is targeted, takes advantage of those. And that's why I couldn't let the talent pass by. And that's why I'm a 37. He would be higher if he had more opportunity, but to be candid, he doesn't. And he's still going to be a decent receiver for you, but probably not a guy that you can rely on week in and week out. Yeah, if he can stay on the field for a full 16-game season, avoid those nasty concussions, you know, he'll be a tremendous player. Man, I loved him when he was with Odell Beckham because he was a perfect Robin to his Batman, and he yes. was always open. Uh, looking at Tier 5, or moving on to Tier 5, I, is it safe to say that these are rookies? Yes, so this Tier 5 is going to be my flyers, and it's going to be rookies because we don't know what they're going to do yet but they're uber talented and they're all in good positions to be able to be successful. The likes of Henry Ruggs or Jalen Rieger, where they're probably going to end up at some point being the number one target guy late in the season. Uh, these are guys you want to take later in the draft that, you know, 10th to 12th round. Again, they're flyers, but they have the talent to possibly drop them to jump up into the top 15 or so if they're given the opportunity. You talk about taking flyers out of this rookie group, a very impressive group of, of receivers. Which one are you taking a flyer on? The one that I would take a flyer on basically because of what he can do and also because of a guy being put on IR is Henry Ruggs. You've heard that Edwards is doing better as a rookie at camp right now or has done well in camp, but you can't tell me that 427 speed is something that everyone has because they don't. He does. He can be another Tyree Kill type guy, and he's a much better wide receiver than I think people give him credit for being. Absolutely. You reminded me a lot of Joy Galloway when I watched him on film at Alabama. Out of all these receivers, who's your biggest sleeper? So my biggest sleeper, if I had to have one for this year, is actually going to be DJ Chark. And the reason is what we talked about earlier. Granted, there's other guys who are better route runners, this, that, and the other. But Chark has great speed. He's six foot three. And they're going to have to throw the ball because they don't have the same amount of defensive talent they used to. He's going to be the guy that leads the team in targets because Gardner Minshew wants him to. And he did whenever Gardner Minshew was on the field last year. I was by, I couldn't find an analogy to go with, uh, you know, great value frosted flakes. Maybe like it's frosted, you know, chips or something like that. But who's the best value receiver out the bunch? So I'm actually going to say a guy here that he's trending in the right direction. That's Debo Samuel. You know, I'm a huge fan. We've gone over this. I'm a huge fan of what Debo Samuel has to offer, but also just in that offense, they find lots of ways to get him the ball. It's not hard because, no, they're not trying to force the ball down a field to him like some receivers. They'll bring him on jet sweeps, little touch passes, things like that. They just want to get the ball in his hands. And he had that foot injury, and it seems like he's healthy and trending towards possibly playing week one. So he's a guy that's he's going to be a great value for you this year, especially in PPR scoring. Who's you taking? Who, who are you uh, staying completely away from? If I had to stay away from someone, I'm actually going to stay away from Stefan Diggs this year. And again, that's not because of Stefan Diggs. It's the situation. Buffalo has a great defense. They have a young quarterback who, while he's getting better, has some accuracy issues. And that doesn't bode well for a precision route runner like Stefan Diggs. I don't think he's going to get the adequate targets to put up the type of numbers he did when he was in Minnesota. Yeah, let's just hey, listen. Diggs is one that that's interesting because I, I think he's a savvy route runner, and he's one that thrives with a quarterback that that is you know effective in both timing, touch, and anticipation. That doesn't sound like Josh Allen, does it? It is not Josh Allen, and Josh <laughs> Allen's getting better, uh, but he's not there yet. Let's move on to tight ends. You know, looking at your top ten list right here, there's no tears with your tight ends. Number one is an easy one, is George Kittle from the San Francisco 49ers. Absolutely, and I know Travis Kelsey is number one for a lot of people, but George Kittle is the clear-cut number one guy on his team for targets. That's not the same for Kansas City with Kelsey. And then George Kittle also, when he's healthy, he's just a beast out there. Puts up big numbers, they look for him, they scheme him wide open a lot, and that's what you want from a tight end. He's the type of guy who can get... 140 targets this year simply because they don't have the depth at wide receiver that they had last year now that Emmanuel Sanders is gone. I wish they gave fantasy points for blocking as well too because he's killer in that aspect but yes. when you talk about blocking you talk about Rob Gronkowski and a lot of free agent movement and shaking kind of affects the rankings you have you know Gronkowski coming out of retirement going to the Bucks, and you also have Austin Hooper going to Cleveland and that's number nine and number 10 respectively. So what are your thoughts on those two guys in those two situations? So unfortunately for, if Gronk was 
back with New England in that offense, I think that Gronk would be a top three or five tight end. In this offense, they don't throw to the tight end. And I think he'll throw a little more because he is comfortable with Gronk. But the offense is just not scheming to throw to the tight end. And they had a lot of talent at tight end last year, and they simply did not use him. So I can't believe that they're going to just start throwing the ball to that position this year when they've never done it in Bruce Arians' offense. And then with Austin Hooper, they paid him for a reason. You know, they had a talented guy there already, and he was supplanted by Hooper. So they're going to target him. And I don't know how much they're going to target him, but I know that they're going to give him an adequate amount of targets. And that's why I have him in my top 10. Yeah, I feel like David Njoku is like the biggest quietly on the trading block, you know, because you don't hear much about him. They brought in Austin Hooper, and I just think it's just a matter of time before we see him moved off. Plus, they drafted Harrison Bryant uh, from Florida Atlantic, another talented rookie tight end. That's going to be interesting to watch um, moving forward. But speaking of a second-year tight end, moving on to 11 through 20, no offense, Denver Broncos, it was funny because last year you had him and TJ Hawkinson coming out of Iowa and everyone was high on Hawkinson when it was Fant who outproduced him as a rookie. Yes. And Fant's going to get more targets this year, but also, I mean, he runs probably a four or five and for a tight end that's smoking. So he doesn't need a lot of targets to get big numbers. He's going to get an adequate amount of targets. And I think he's going to have a great breakout season this year. Now that Drew Locke is the true quarterback and he did a good job again to end last year. Speaking of breakout, is this the year we finally see Blake Jarwin get an opportunity to break out? That's what they're saying. And so I'm in a position where he's got the talent. I need to see if they're going to actually give him the opportunity, though. And with no preseason games, don't know. So that's why he's ranked a little lower. But he's in a position that should be really good for him. And I think he could actually be a sleeper because we just don't know yet. So take a flyer on him. Well, we reached that part where you, you know the drill. Best value, biggest sleeper, and who you stand away from. Gotcha. So my biggest value is Mike Gusecki. So in that offense, to end the season, he was getting seven or eight targets every week. And he started putting up really good numbers. I think he had a lot of top five finishes to end the season. So we saw the talent coming out of Penn State, and now they have – Fitzpatrick's going to start at quarterback, but then once Tua actually gets going, I think he's going to be very comfortable throwing to a guy like Gusecki at the tight end position. It's interesting because we never really saw Tua work the tight end because they didn't really have one at Alabama. So it's going to be exciting to see him work with one as talented as Gusecki uh, here in Miami. So that's your quarterback through tight end rankings. CJ will take a quick break and be back with more fantasy football starting lineup. Football Game Plan is brought to you in part by Financial Coaching LLC, Investment, Retirement, Security, Stewardship Credit, Financial Growth is in your hands, StewardshipCredit.com, Adrian Marie Photo, Photographer, Writer, Management, Adrian Marie Photography.com, Lock Multimedia, Ninth and Lux, visit the website ninthandlux.com and check out the clothing gallery. Nesby Phipps, art, life, entertainment, nesbyphipps.com. Grind It Out Fitness, visit the website grinditoutfitness.com and download the app. And welcome back to Football Game Plan's Fantasy Football starting lineup here with Chris James. I'm Emery Hunt, the czar of the playbook, and we've reached a part of the show. And this is the cool part, because every week on the show, we'll give you Chris's starting lineup, both his starts and his sits. So, Chris, let's just jump right into your starting lineup. And as we go through this list, man, you're really high on this Raiders-Panthers game. Two guys on offense made your stardom list and Josh Jacobs, and also DJ Moore. Absolutely. I think this is going to be one of those sneaky games where a lot of points are scored. Uh, we talked about it a little earlier where Carolina's offense, I think, is going to be really good this year, but their defense is still a work in progress. Similarly, over on the Oakland side, their defense has gotten better, but that secondary still isn't where it needs to be yet. So I think you'll see a lot of targets to DJ Moore, and I think he's going to put up big numbers. And then on the other side, again, that linebacker level isn't ready. 
in my opinion, on the Carolina side. So Josh Jacobs will get a lot of carries and possibly put up a touchdown or two because they're going to make sure to feed him early and often in this particular matchup. Now let's move right along to your sit em starting lineup, so to speak. So guys that you will sit this week, and it's funny because it, it pairs up perfectly. On your starts, you had the Bills defense, and staring me right in the face on your sit em is running back Le'Veon Bell. Absolutely. So Le'Veon Bell has always been a great producer. Right now, even though he's getting the volume, he's not putting up the numbers that you would expect. There seems to be a little tension there between he and the coaching staff. And the Bills defense is built to stop that type of offense. I would steer clear of anyone who plays on the Jets to open this week, even a guy as good as Le'Veon Bell. I also see you have the Browns defense sitting this week, and, and they're facing the Baltimore Ravens. Are you expecting that Ravens offense to hit the ground running literally and figuratively? Yes, it's it's twofold here. So they had some injuries especially at safety with Delpy going out. So I think there's going to be some confusion on the back end. And while people want to say that Lamar Jackson might not be the best passer, we understand that that's false. And I think the Browns will learn how false that is because they're going to come out with a bad taste in their mouth from losing to the Titans last year and look to put up all the points in week one. Man, you're absolutely right. You saw how they rebounded in that second game against the Browns after the Browns took it to them. Uh, Nick Chubb and company ran all over Baltimore in the first matchup of the season. So excited to see week one kick off. Before we get out of here, Chris, what's the biggest storyline you're excited to see as we kick off the NFL season in 2020? Biggest storyline is here, to be honest. It seems like the 2014 All-Star team is being put together here in Tampa. Now, but seriously, Tampa has moved and ascended from a team that couldn't make the playoffs to now – I think they have the third best odds to win the Super Bowl. So that's going to be the biggest story is the confluence of the new players, the drafted players, and also an ascending defense from last year. Can it actually get the job done and get to a Super Bowl to be played here in Tampa? You know, that's what I was going to bring up, how no one is talking about their defense. They drafted Antoine Winfield, and quietly their defense, especially their secondary, got better as the season went on. They brought back Ndamukong Sue up front. So there's a lot to like about Tampa. It's not just Tom Brady in that offense. But, Chris, it's been fun talking shop with you. Yeah. For Chris James, I'm Emory Hunt. Follow Chris on Twitter at CJ49. I'm at FBall Game Plan. Make sure to subscribe to Football Game Plan's Power Rankings and all that good stuff you see on Football Game Plan's YouTube channel at YouTube.com slash Football Game Plan. Also, subscribe on iTunes to Football Game Plan Podcast and leave us a five-star rating.